now I can hit record, which will make the viewers happy. Okay, welcome to the Propeller 2 Live Forum. Today's topic is C programming with the Propeller 2 with Eric Smith. Thank you, Eric, for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, it's a very popular, well-attended topic. We had just short of 50 signups for this one. And what I invite everybody to do is to buzz on over here um, while Eric is getting set up and make an offering to Eric's Patreon. So we're passing around the offertory right now and that's gonna run for the whole duration of this presentation. So. No, thanks, Ken. <laughs> you don't ask for yourself, so we're definitely going to do it for you. In other news, the this board, the P2 evaluation board um, that connects the WX module, this little adapter is sent off. Parts are coming. We're going to have them in two weeks, and it will be used in a presentation in September by Jeff and Michael when they show how to use the propeller tool to wirelessly program the P2. So that's coming. Um, also, this click adapter is coming. These are pretty simple assemblies and no testing required to parallax, so we shouldn't have any delay to get these things made. We're still waiting on um, the build of the accessory set with the new Gortzel board. And I have launched on the forums a discussion thread that uh, Jeff and a few others are monitoring very closely, which was, what would you like out of an ESP32 object? So we're learning, watching, and listening, and then we hope to produce a really good object that everybody could use um, in hopes that every P2 is connected to the internet in a clean way. Also, if you have an application with the Propeller 1 and 2, I think I've mentioned we're building a new website, I would really like to have your commercial products featured on our new site. Um, sometimes they're research, research projects, other times you're building products. And um, we'd like to have pictures and a description of them. This is one you may have seen. This is Aqua AI. And this is a Norwegian company that has robotic fish that are swimming around in fish farms in Norway, collecting all kinds of data so they can improve their environmental responsibility. And that has a propeller flip one in it. Pretty cool. I think most people have seen this, but uh, I'm going to keep sharing it. And they've actually done some programming in Blockly, too, with that. New objects. Johnny Mac, thank you. Everybody do a thumbs up for Johnny Mac. <laughs> All right, because Johnny Mac is currently the near sole author of the new OBEX on GitHub. And he's posted the RGB driver. I think that's the NeoPixel WS2812 driver, John. Yeah, that will do any of the one wire smart pixels. So the WS28 series, uh, the SK68 series, which is a 32 bit um, and has, because a lot of those have white chips in them. So yeah, any of the single wire 800 kilohertz, it'll handle. It's got start methods for all. I anybody that used the P1 version, it's the same thing. Um, all of the spin methods, I, I added one simple one, but it was just an add. Uh, they, they really, the only, hard, not hard, but the only involved work was translating the assembly to P2, which shrunk quite a bit. P2 assembly is really, really efficient. And it's about, I don't know, probably 40% smaller in assembly on the P2 than on the P1 doing exactly the same thing. That's awesome. I hope we get to a point in future uh, presentations when people are using these objects and sharing their projects. I'd hope to have this running today. Next week, Chip is presenting the latest iteration of his graphical debug, which you're looking at right now. This thing is totally cool. Eight channels up to 16 displays of data. And he's getting along quite well with that. Looking forward to it, Chip. You're muted, but I saw you nod your head. And then we have a vacancy for three weeks of presentation. Uh, we really don't want to take a summer break from this, so I'm looking for some good um, presentations to fill in before September 2nd when Jeff and Michael 
talk about the propeller tool and show the wireless programming in it. So if anybody wants to present, uh, just contact me or go fill in the form that's on the forums and we'll get y'all set up. Today, Eric, excited to learn about this. So Chip and I were also chatting about it this morning and I saw you on the forums asking a lot of questions, getting your agenda straight. This is great. So I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, thank you. And I have to find the stop share button. All you. Okay. Uh, whoops, how do I share? I'll make you host again. I think I can just share my screen if you give me permission. I'm not sure. Now you're good to go. Uh, okay, is that showing up all right? Beautiful. Okay. Great. Right. So today I was going to talk about the C programming options that are available for the P2. Um, there isn't any one <laughs> ultimate solution, um, but there's there are several competing possibilities that are good for different purposes. And I'm going to uh, try to talk about those. Obviously, I'm most familiar with the ones I've written. Um, so I probably won't do full justice to Ross's Catalina, but I will try to talk about some of its features. Um, and as I say, they're all, you know, there's a number of, of good C compilers. So just to start off, you know, why would we want C? I mean, we've got spin two, um, and that's kind of the official language. But there is a lot of existing code in C um, and a lot of programmers who know it. Um, learning a new language doesn't always go over well for, you know, if it, it's, a, it's a big hurdle to make people learn a new language and a new processor. So it's, it's good to have C as an option. Um, and it also helps porting existing code. Uh, another reason is performance. Um, C is usually compiled to native code. I think all of the uh, four compilers I'm going to talk about generate hub exec code, which is you know, significantly faster than spin byte code. Um, and uh, C compilers tend to be, you know, most of them have been around for a while. They have a lot of, of nifty optimization to make your code go faster. Another nice thing about C, of course, is floating point. Um, sometimes it's nice to just be able to write A plus B <laughs> instead of having to use an object to add things. And C um, has structs and C++ has classes, which are um, a little more flexible than spin two objects. Um, although Chip has really done a lot with spin two, it's actually the spin two objects you can do a lot with. Um, they, they're, they're pretty similar to structs and classes, but C and C++ do give you a little bit, you know, even more flexibility. <laughs> Um, so there are a number of C compilers available now, uh, each with its shortcomings and benefits. So the compilers I'm going to talk about today are um, Catalina, uh, FastSpin, P2, GCC, and RISC-V P2. Um, there is also a new compiler that's just been announced on the forums um, based on LLVM. Uh, the, the front end is called Clang. Um, that one's, that compiler is uh, under development, um, so it's in very early stages. I wasn't able to compile much with it, but it certainly looks promising and it'll be interesting to see um, what comes of it. So I'm not going to talk much about that one, um, given that it is not quite usable yet, but definitely it's something to keep an eye out for. So we'll start with Catalina. Um, uh, it was created by Ross H, um, and it's been around for a long time. He wrote it for the P1 originally. Uh, it's based on LCC, which is a mature compiler. Uh, I think it originally came in a textbook, and it's been used in education a lot. It's a very portable compiler, uh, and I think pretty solid at this point. Uh, it supports the C89 dialect of C, which is kind of like the first official C standard. Um, supports both P1 and P2. 
And it comes with a lot of stuff. It's got an IDE, um, a lot of libraries, and excellent documentation. So Catalina is, is a, a very good choice for newcomers. Um, now, unfortunately, I'm on Linux, and my version of Linux is a little older than Ross's, so I'm not able to run all of the the nice, uh, you know, like the GUI and, and stuff where I demo it. Um, so I need to get a newer version of Linux one of these days. But it is cross-platform. It, it's, he's got Linux and Windows versions, and I think someone was trying to build it for the Mac. I'm not sure if, if that worked out or not. So the pros and cons for Catalina, um, it's definitely mature and stable. Um, I think, you know, I don't think there's very many bugs in Catalina. Uh, it's based on a compiler. You know, LCC is, is very portable and, and very straightforward. Um, Ross has done a great job with documentation and he has a lot of libraries that ship with Catalina. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I found it almost a little bit confusing. There was so many, so much stuff, but he has, he has documented it pretty well. Um, uh, the P1 supports a nice bonus. You can use the same code. You know, if it's simple enough, you could use the same code for both P1 and P2 projects. Um, a pretty unique feature of Catalina is that it allows you to write interrupt handlers in C. Uh, this is obviously new for the P2, and I'm not sure how well it's been tested yet. But in theory, you could write, you know, you could have some of your code running as, an, as interrupt handlers in C functions, which is something I don't think any of the other compilers supports yet. So that's definitely a, a nice feature of Catalina. Um, besides the native hub exec mode, Ross has also written a compact mode, which creates a kind of form of bytecode, which is quite a bit smaller than the native code. Um, but at the expense of speed, it's also a lot slower. Um, so, you know, there's some nice options there. And I think Catalina is a good choice for someone who's starting out on, with doing C programming on the P2. Um, you know, having the IDE and the, and the documentation and libraries is definitely helpful. There are a few cons though, of course. Um, it's C89 is, is the original C standard, and it's pretty old at this point. Most of the other compilers do at least C99, and you know, many of them are C11 and, and more recent versions of C. So some code that you get from the web might not be able to compile. Um, another con is that it's only got 32-bit types, and a lot of C compilers will support 64 bits, which is kind of useful, especially when you're dealing with, you know, the sets of pins or things like that. Um, and probably the biggest con for Catalina is that it's, it's not very performant. Um, the code it generates is, is certainly faster than, you know, spin two byte code, but it's not, uh, it's not as fast as any of the other compilers. And we'll, we'll look at that in the benchmarks. Um, as I say, I wish I could show the GUI. Um, I'm a command line kind of guy myself, actually, so I haven't missed it. <laughs> and, and that's why I've never really bothered to try to get it working. Or to Eric, question about the compact mode. Yes. Um, is it running an interpreter of sorts that executes compiled C routines? Um, yeah, the C, the C routine is, the C is converted to a kind of bytecode. It's, it's a lot like um, CMM mode on uh, prop GCC, if you're familiar with that. It, Basically, instructions, the Propeller 2 instructions are replaced with, I think it's 16-bit, um, you know, codes. And there's, there's an interpreter that reads those and interprets them at runtime. Thanks. So, yeah. It's, it's more of a virtual machine kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's similar to, to what Chip did with Spin 2. Um, Although I think Ross has, has designed the bytecode, the, the compact, Catalina compact mode is a little in between spin bytecode and the machine instructions, like there's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping. And uh, I think they're pretty quick to decode. I, so the performance is kind of in between pub exec and, and spin two bytecode. Any other questions on? Catalina, I, I wish, wish uh, Ross could have made it. Um, 
because I'm sure he could tell you a lot of the other nice features of Catalina, but it's, it's well worth checking out. Um, as I say, it's, it's mature, it's been around a long time, and it's based on LCC is, is you know, 30 years old, I think. So it's, it's definitely a stable compiler, um, but not, not a speed demon. That's kind of the only the drawback yeah. of it. Based on the thread on the forums, it sounds like you might do some of your suggested adjustments to get some of the performance back. Yeah, that might help. So it'll be interesting to see how he can do with that. Um, so I'm, I'm going in alphabetical order of the compilers just to try to remove any bias. So, <laughs> so after Catalina is Fastbin, which I've written, um, it's a custom compiler. I, I wrote it from scratch. Um, and originally it was a spin compiler uh, for, for P1. But now I, along the way I added basic and then C support as well. So it can compile all three languages for both P1 and P2. It supports the C99 standard, which is pretty much the, the baseline these days for, for most compilers. And it has a few C++ extensions. It's nowhere near C++, but it does have classes and it has a few handy features from C++. And Fastbin also has some custom extensions for accessing Spin2 and basic objects. So you can call spin2 code directly from C code with fastbin. I'm not sure what Ross's plans are for Catalina. In P1, he did have a way to interpret spin. And I think he wants to do that for P2 as well, but I don't know how far along that is. <laughs> with fastbin, on the other hand, it just compiles the spin2 code into hubexec, so it can call directly. So the, the pros and cons for Fastbin, um, it's definitely easy to interface with existing drivers. Um, you know, it, so you can, you can take the official objects from the OBEX and hook them up very easily to your C code. Um, it's got pretty good bit banging performance. The low level optimizations are designed for the P2, you know, since it was written from scratch for the P2, the low level code optimization is, is pretty good, I think. Uh, I am biased, <laughs> but for, for sort of small inner loops, it, it can generate code that's as, pretty much as good as a, a human writing the code. Um, the inline assembly feature, Catalina doesn't have inline assembly, Fastbin does, uh, and it's very easy to integrate. It's a lot like the Spin2, um, inline assembly, the chip added. And uh, so you can directly access variables and it's just, it, it's much easier than the inline assembly of GCC, which is kind of has an awkward syntax. And Fastbin supports both P1 and P2. So like Catalina, it can be used for developing on both platforms. But there are definitely cons to Fastbin as well. Um, probably the biggest one right now is that there's no linker. Uh, you have to build in one step. So you have to specify all the, the source code on the command line. Um, eventually, I would like to add a front end that generates some kind of object file to, to make it easier to port code with make files and things like that. But that doesn't exist yet. Um, Fastbin doesn't have 64-bit support yet either. Um, so like Catalina, it's limited to 32-bit to types. Um, the Fastbin library is still pretty limited. It's, it's under development. Um, you know, you can do some things with it, but uh, there's probably some missing features. And as, as a compiler written from scratch, it's, it's definitely not as stable as ones that have been around longer. Um, so there's, there's still bugs in Fastbin. Um, so I would say Fastbin is a good choice for, you know, interfacing with spin code, for doing device drivers or small projects where you need high performance. Um, any questions on that? Just wanted to add in 
regarding the no linker thing, you do have your special uh, decoration on declaration of functions that will tell it to go get the CPP file. So you don't necessarily have to list every file if your headers are set up correctly. That's true. Yes. Uh, I did try to add, uh, it's, it's non-standard, unfortunately, but I did, I did add a feature where the header files can specify the source file to look for the things in. So yes, um, you don't have to include the standard libraries, for example, those get included automatically when you include the, the header files. And yeah, you can set up your project. Basically, um, there is a GUI for Fastspin um, called Flex GUI. And it's set up so that you can just have your main program. And if you've specified everything in your headers, you can uh, just hit compile and it'll automatically find everything. Okay, um, so the next one I wanted to talk about was P2GCC, um, which was created by Dave Hine. I think it was probably the first C compiler that was available for the uh, P2, based on Prop GCC or GCC 4.6. And it, what, the way it works is it uh, translates the P1 output of Prop GCC into P2 code. So it's not exactly a native compiler, but P1 is pretty close to being a subset of P2. So uh, it's, it's reasonably efficient. Um, and being based on prop GCC, it's you know, probably gonna be easier to port code from P1 C code to, to P2. Um, it's got decent performance. Um, it's based on GCC. It's, it's a little bit of an older version of GCC, but it's certainly a, a stable, you know, well-regarded compiler. Um, but, you know, PTG, P2GCC is a little bit of a hack. <laughs> so there's incomplete libraries. Um, the linker, Dave had to write his own assembler and linker, uh, which are actually pretty nice. I think Ross ended up using Dave's assembler. Um, not sure about the linker. I think he, he used his own linker. But uh, the, the P2GCC linker is a little non-standard and the front end for it, like the command line, is lacking many of the options that prop GCC supports. So you, it doesn't support C++, it doesn't support any different optimization choices, you're stuck with optimizing for size. And the syntax is a little non-standard. If you don't put the spaces in in the right places, you get a, an error. And of course, since it's a P1 compiler at, at its heart, it doesn't have any P2 specific optimizations. Now, I think uh, Roger Lowe has extended P2 GCC a bit to add in a few um, additional P2 optimizations, but I'm not sure if he's released that anywhere. I haven't seen it. Um, I haven't used P2GCC a lot. I, you know, I've built the benchmarks and run some of the programs that Dave shipped with the original version. Um, and it, you know, it, it definitely works, um, but there are a few holes. And the last compiler I was going to talk about um, is, is also one I wrote. It's uh, called RISC-5, or R actually, I guess it is pronounced RISC-5, uh, RISC-5-P2, which is basically a script that turns a RISC-5 toolchain into a P2 toolchain. And the current binary releases on my webpage are based on GCC 8.3. So the way this one works is that it uh, does just-in-time compiling uh, to convert the RISC-V instructions to P2 instructions at runtime. So basically there's a linker, that you take the existing RISC-V toolchain and add a special linker script that links a different startup file, which is P2 code and which is the, the P2 compiler. And then um, 
you know, at runtime, that compiler goes through the RISC-V instructions, compiles them, and then executes them. Uh, RISC-V is an extensible architecture. They've actually reserved custom instructions. So there are, uh, I took advantage of that to define a bunch of custom instructions for the P2 instructions. So direct hardware access is, is efficient. You know, if you want to write to the smart pins, you basically get one RISC-V instruction for that, and that translates into one P2 instruction. So the, the pros and cons, the pros, um, surprisingly, it has good performance. It actually has the best results on, on many of the benchmarks and uh, good, good performance on other benchmarks. Um, Roger and I kind of went back and forth with P2 GCC and RISC V P2 for MicroPython because um, I originally used RISC V P2 to compile MicroPython. And he, he did the native port and we kind of traded <laughs> performance uh, improvements. And so for, you know, I started, mine started out faster, then his got faster, then I added some more optimizations to the compiler and got faster and then he overtook me again. I think where we left it, his, his custom P2GCC is a little faster. So MicroPython compiled with that is, is faster than compiled with RISC-V, but not, much, it's like 10% faster now, I think it was his final version. Um, and the RISC-V version is smaller because the RISC-V instructions are, are smaller than uh, P2 instructions. The, um, the tool chain, of course, since it's a standard RISC-V tool chain, it's well supported. You know, other people have to <laughs> worry about maintaining that part. All we have to do is uh, maintain the the translator from RISC-V to P2. Um, GCC 8.3 is a modern, you know, popular compiler, supports the C11 standard, and it ha has full C++ support. So it's the only one of these compilers that can compile C++ code. But, you know, of course there are cons. <laughs> so the um, there's an instruction cache. So basically the, at runtime we translate instructions from the RISC-V to P2 and put them in a cache. Um, so that cache adds a, a fixed amount of memory that's always used. Um, so for small programs, the compression that you get from RISC-V actually doesn't help very much because the instruction cache uses up the space. But for big programs like MicroPython, you end up ahead. Um, there's no inline assembly or, well, there is inline assembly, but it's RISC-V inline assembly, uh, which means, I mean, you can write the custom P2 instructions like to, to access smart pins or read and write pins directly, but um, you have to kind of, it's kind of a hack to do that because I haven't modified the RISC-V assembler to understand the, uh, the P2 mnemonics. And I'll show later how you can do it. Um, there's latency issues. So once the code's been translated, as long as it fits in the instruction cache, which is about 32K, um, it runs at full speed, but there is some latency while it's being compiled. And then if the code is, you know, if the, if the loops are really big and don't, uh, the hot spots of your code don't fit in the instruction cache, then the performance drops a lot. And right now it only supports C code running on one cog. Uh, you can run P2 assembly language on any cogs, on the other cogs, but the C code can only run on one at the moment. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about RISC-V P2 later, just because it is kind of unusual and may not have been used much, but... Eric, can I, gonna... can I ask a question oh. on that? Sure. Uh, you mentioned in the other compilers whether or not they supported 64-bit uh, arithmetic. Does uh, does this support 64-bit? Yep, it supports everything. It's got 64-bit. It's got double, full double precision, so 64-bit doubles. Um, it may even support 128-bit. I haven't tried that, but a lot of GCC versions have 128-bit 
arithmetic built in. Um, so anything you'd want to do on a, you know, anything in the C standard is there. And the library is fairly complete as well. It's a, uh, called NewLib. It's a standard library that's used on a lot of micros. So in terms of what's there, everything in the C language is there. It's, it's a complete compiler. So I thought I, I compiled some different benchmarks to get a uh, feeling for how these different compilers perform. Um, so the first one I was going to look at is called CoreMark, which is a, a standard benchmark. Uh, it was designed for measuring performance of microprocessors and, and microcontrollers. Um, it's, it's fairly modern. It's, I think, the, I forget the name of the organization that um, supports it, but you, you find you know, CoreMark benchmarks quoted in, in most uh, manufacturers' data sheets. And it's designed to be a little harder to game. People used to use a benchmark called Drystone, but that one has is not particularly good. <laughs> Compilers have gotten really good at recognizing Drystone and sort of optimizing it. Um, but of course, now that CoreMark is popularized, I, I think compiler writers are definitely trying to improve their performance on CoreMark as well. So it may just um, it's harder to game, but I'm sure there's still some uh, specializations for CoreMark going on. Um, so as you can see, um, the RISC-V P2 actually turned in the highest performance. So the, the, I, I disabled floating point um, because I had some trouble with P2GCC when I tried to enable floats. Um, that's probably me. I, I know that Dave did provide a way to support floats, but I couldn't find it. Um, so these iterations are just to the nearest integer rather than, you know, giving the higher precision, but it gives you a, a good idea of the performance. Um, so P2GCC did pretty well, almost as well as RISC-V. Uh, fast spin is sort of eh, mediocre. I'd like to see that come up. One reason is that I could only use the O1, the, the, the default optimization level, and not O2. When I tried to compile it with O2, it didn't run correctly. Um, CoreMark actually has like a whole bunch of checksums and things that it does to, to verify that everything is executed properly. And some of those failed. So I'm going to try to dig into that. Uh, hopefully, I can get Fastbin O2 working and get numbers that are closer to P2GCCs. And Catalina with the, the maximum optimization level uh, came in last. Um, again, I don't think that's, that's sort of not what you use Catalina for. It's not a speed demon, but it is a kind of reliable and, and definitely easy to use. The code size is probably tells more about the libraries than anything else. Um, the RISC-V has a pretty big library, and it also has that 32K instruction cache, which is counted in the, the binary size here. So it's definitely the biggest on something like this. Uh, P2GCC has pretty minimal libraries. Um, Fastbin and Catalina kind of have similar libraries. Actually, Catalina's library is more complete than Fastbin's. I guess Fastbin's code generator on moi is just not quite as good uh, at reducing code size as Catalina's for this benchmark. Um, so another benchmark um, is from the forum, a um, user named Heater, who hasn't been around as much lately, but he, he was a, a very active contributor and he wrote a, an FFT test for P1, which I ported to P2. Um, and, you know, FFT is a pretty common kind of thing that a DSP or microprocessor has to do. So um, this is also, a, you know, a decent test of uh, compiler speed. Again, RISC-V 
had the best performance on this one as well. Um, now I've actually given two numbers here. Uh, the default RISC-V uses a cache in hub memory. And you can see it's a pretty big, you know, that adds a, pretty, a lot of, of space to the, um, you know, its hub RAM footprint. And it also, in this case, uh, sorry, it also has the option of, of putting the cache in LUT. So then it's only a 2K instruction cache, but it's faster and obviously, you know, smaller, not as big a footprint. In this particular benchmark, that resulted in, in quite a bit better performance. Most benchmarks, it's not going to because most of the time, the, you know, the code of interest does not fit in the 2K and then it thrashes as it recompiles continually and, and the performance drops down a lot. But this gives you a kind of a, an idea of how much performance gain you can get by running from LUT as opposed to hub exec. And you also get some size gain. Um, Fastbin turned in respectable performance, only a little bit behind risk five. Um, and, you know, sort of decent size. P2GCC and Catalina weren't quite as performant, um, but again, the numbers are respectable. Um, so there's not a huge difference. It's a matter of like 2x or 3x between compilers. So they all, they all turn on pretty decent performances. And the last test I had was of a, a simple bit bang SPI. Um, this is just sending 512 bytes on a sort of simulated uh, SPI bus. So this is kind of like where you get into really low level bit banging. Now in the real world, you'd use smart pins for this if you could, but sometimes you can't, or you know, there, there might be some, probably SPI isn't a good example, but there may be some custom protocols where you do have to do bit banging. Um, and here there, there's quite a range of performance in these different compilers. Uh, so fast spin was definitely able to optimize this one well and turn in the best performance by a considerable margin. It also had the smallest code size. Um, the code size here, I've tried to estimate just the code for the, the program itself uh, without any libraries. Uh, RISC-V turned in, yeah, you know, respectable performance. It, it came in second, uh, quite a bit slower than fast spin, but that's because it doesn't have as many optimizations for P2. Um, and I compiled for, there was a choice of optimizing for speed or optimizing for size. Uh, optimized for speed, it does almost twice as fast, but it's almost four times as big. So, you know, you, you have the trade-off available. Fastbin only has optimized for speed. It doesn't have a a size optimization option, but in this case, it had a pretty good code size anyway. P2GCC only has an optimized for size option. Um, and because it doesn't know as much about the P2, it isn't able to get down uh, to quite a small uh, um, footprint. And the performance isn't quite as good. It's, it's respectable though. I was able to compile this with the new LLVM based compiler. Um, it's probably not really fair to put it in here because it's, it's still such early days on that compiler, but I think everyone's curious about it. So just to see how it, it performed um, because this was such a simple benchmark, it didn't really need any libraries or anything. I was able to compile it with Clang, the, the LLVM based compiler. Um, the performance isn't that great yet. But I'm sure you know it's still very early days. It'll it'll definitely improve. And the code size was eh, kind of competitive with Risk Five, a little bit bigger, but um, that's not too surprising. The Risk Five instructions are are more compact. And Catalina, um, 
for Catalina, I compiled it with native or with compact. And you can see the compact is almost 10 times slower, unfortunately, for this particular benchmark. And it isn't a whole lot smaller. I think that's a, probably an artifact of the benchmark. Um, usually, you'd see more like a half. The, the, the code, in, you usually get a better code saving uh, from compact mode. But um, we didn't this time. So that's, oops. So what did we learn from the benchmarks? Um, well, Fastbin is, is definitely the best for low level stuff like SPI because of its detailed knowledge of the P2. It can do optimizations like noticing that, you know, the carry bit is set after a shift and things like that. So it, and it, it knows most of the P2 instructions so it can take advantage of those. Um, however, the, the GCC-based compilers, the RISC-V and P2GCC, have better high-level optimizations. So for a, a complicated algorithm, like the ones in uh, Quarmark or even FFT, um, those optimizations actually win you more than the low-level you know, instruction replacement that FastSpin can do. So for big, complicated programs, the GCC compilers will give you better performance. Catalina is not a speed demon. Um, strength is in the user experience, which is definitely much better. You know, it's got a nice IDE, it's got a debugger, it's got a lot of good libraries. Um, but, so it's good to pick Catalina for development, but your final product, if you need speed, you might choose a different compiler. So just wanted to talk a little bit about why RISC-V P2 does so well. Um, because, you know, people are surprised. They say, oh, it's an emulator. How can it outperform the native compilers? Well, it really is a compiler. It is really compiling into P2 code. Um, the only difference is the final compilation stage happens on the P2 itself at runtime, rather than being done on the PC ahead of time. And it's converting from the RISC-V instructions to P2 instructions. Um, RISC-V is you know, designed by guys who really know what they're doing. Um, it's a good match for C. So it actually makes a good intermediate representation for you know, the C code gets translated very well to RISC-V instructions. And those are low level and easy to translate to P2 instructions. Another advantage of RISC-V is that it has a lot of registers, 31 registers. Catalina has 24, P2GCC has 16. So more registers helps. Um, it reduces memory traffic. Uh, on the P2, that's pretty important. Loads and stores cause stalls, and they're expensive on the P2. You want to keep things in registers as much as possible. And there are a few things that RISC-V can do um, because it's just in time, it can notice some things at runtime that are not available statically. There's not much that it actually, it only takes a limited advantage of that right now. It can sort of automatically inline some functions and things that, but, um, so this is only a minor part of its improvement uh, of why it's performed so well, but it does help a little bit. It'll certainly be interesting to see if the new LLVM compiler can outperform the RISC-V compiler. One would hope so. Uh, it probably will, but you know, we will have to see. Um, so under the hood, the RISC-V P2 uh, is compiling RV32 iMac. That's the particular version of RISC-V. It has integer instructions, multiply divide, Atomic, um, that corresponds to the locks on the P2, and compressed op codes, which uh, help with code size reduction. And it has op codes reserved for custom extensions used for the P2 instructions. So, for example, to write a value to a pin, there's a, a custom RISC-V instruction for doing that. 
and nearly all of the P2 instructions are available this way. Um, the only problem is the assembler hasn't been updated for those. So instead of writing pin W R1 R2, you have to write dot INSN, which is a special assembler directive, custom zero, which is kind of saying what kind of instruction it is, the particular opcode, the register, and then the immediate value, and then the other register. Um, floating point and IO are actually implemented in P2 assembly by a risk five system calls. So when the program makes a system call, uh, it traps into the compiler, the, the, the P2 just in time compiler and executes some routines that are already written in P2 assembly for the floating point stuff. And actually eventually I'd hope to add uh, floating point instruction emulation to speed this up a little bit. Uh, some of the custom instructions, it's kind of neat actually the way it, it works out. You can, um, but I probably shouldn't <laughs> ramble on about that too much. But uh, for example, drive C, drive not C, drive not, and drive rand are all one risk five instruction um, with some bits in the immediate value telling whether you're writing a register value or writing the universe of the register value. If you want to write a constant like drive low or drive high, you use the RISC-V register X0, which is hard coded to zero. And the compiler recognizes this and generates drive low or drive high. And you can specify a pin with a register plus the base. So if you want to specify one particular pin, if you know it's pin 56, you can say base is 56 and the register is X0. So at zero. Otherwise, you could use like a base register uh, and to say your pin group and then the offset from the register. And at compile time, it translates all that into the appropriate P2 instructions. Uh, I probably shouldn't belabor this, but basically all the instructions, you know, there's smart pin instructions, single operand instructions, uh, like cog stop. Everything from hubset to next int three is all one custom instruction. And all the two operand instructions are a, a different custom one instruction where you it basically just takes the upper bits of the P2 instruction and stuffs them into the compiled code. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping. And cog init and cortic have to be handled a little bit specially because they have to set up the Q register, but there's special instructions for those as well. So that's that's the, the compilers, the four compilers. And I kind of rushed through a little bit, but any questions? On that part? If not, then I'll go on to sort of just general C issues for the P2. Um, for example, writing portable C. Um, given that at present, we don't really have an ideal C compiler for the P2. Uh, they all have their different strengths and weaknesses. It's probably good to write your code as portably as possible so you can change compilers. If something better comes along or if you find, you know, if you start out with Catalina to develop because it's got such a nice GUI, but then later you want to recompile it with P2GCC or something for, for higher speed. So to do that, you should avoid inline assembly. Um, every compiler has got a different syntax for inline assembly. Um, and Catalina doesn't have inline assembly at all. You have to put the assembly in a separate file and compile it separately. So avoid that <laughs> if you want it to be portable. Use Propeller2.h instead. That's the header file that we're trying to make standard among the different compilers. Ross and I have uh, at least mostly <laughs> got similar Propeller2.h in our compile in our various compilers, and it's straightforward enough that any future compiler should also be able to, to define it. Um, and they've got mostly the instructions have macros in there in propeller2.h. 
obviously you want to avoid any GCC specific extensions like attribute. Um, there's a lot of that in existing P2, P1 code, unfortunately. Uh, people tended to assume it's prop GCC, that's what we're going to be using. So um, the simple libraries have got these all over the place. And I think poor Roy has probably been <laughs> busy taking those out to port them to Fastbin. If you think you might want to use Catalina, make sure you only use C89, the original ANSI C standard. Don't use newer features like declaring, declaring variables inside for loops and things like that. Uh, there's a tool called spin to cpp which I'll discuss later to convert spin objects. Um, if you're using Fastbin, you can call spin2 directly, but if you want it to be portable, you're going to have to use some other way to get your code, your spin objects to talk to your C code. Different compilers have different ways of laying out memory. Some of them start at the top and, and the stack goes downwards. Some of them are more like spin and start at, you know, the stack grows upwards. Um, just don't assume anything about that if you um, probably shouldn't assume anything about variable sizes. If you really need a 32 bit variable, you should use you know, int 32 from standard int.h. Although, to be honest, I think all the P2 compilers will make int 32 bits, short 16 bits, and character 8 bits. So, probably doesn't. This isn't as big a deal. And only RISC 5 right now has 64 bit doubles. Um, so, for portability, you should use float rather than double. Uh, or at least don't assume that the thing that you're calling double is really a double precision <laughs> number. It may just be 32 bits. So to use spin2 objects from C, um, as I mentioned, fastbin can do it directly, but otherwise to use spin to CPP, which is basically the same engine as fastbin, but it outputs C or C++ instead of P2 assembler. And it's a command line only tool right now. There's no GUI for it, but it's pretty simple. You just say spin to CPP. Um, the default is C++ because it came from the P1 world where we had C++. So you have to give it a command line that says C code to generate C and then the name of the spin to driver. And that'll produce two files, driver.c and driver.h, which contain the translated um, you know, the spin to convert it into C. So the way it works is it compiles the, the PASM block um, into a binary blob. It, it basically resolves everything, all the symbols, and takes your, your PASM2 code and just creates a big array with, with the binary data that can be loaded into the cog. Uh, and this will work even for RISC-V. Um, it treats the other cogs as being coprocessors. So even though the main code is running RISC-V instructions, the other cogs can run P2 assembly. Spin to CPP can translate the spin methods automatically to C or C++. Um, and that's sort of the normal way you would do it. But I know some people like John prefer to handcraft their code. Um, so it is also possible in spin to CPP to include the C code you want directly via some special comments. So you can have your spin methods and then have some special comments and give the C methods that are equivalent to those. And spin to CPP will just pass those through into the final output. It'll, it'll assemble the PASM block, but it'll leave alone the C code that you wrote. So we could have drivers that, you know, if, if you want to handcraft your driver, you can do that or you can just automatically translate it. Um, and actually, let me just see if I can bring up. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try to bring up an example. Thanks, Roy, for answering all the questions in the chat. No worries. 
for some reason, this is not. Oh, I know what I have to do. I have to exit. Okay, there's, you're, you're going to see some spin to CPP limitations, but first I was going to try to show. Um, here's a VGA text driver written in spin. I don't know how easy it is to read this. Um, my font is a little bit small. Eric, try to uh, click on share screen, but then choose an application. And I think we can see this better. Okay, let me see if see. that works. The share button is uh, below your I main zoom this. window. And I, I don't know why it disappears unless you hover over it. Okay, yeah, is that that's better. better? Uh huh. Yeah, okay. and then people can drag that larger too, and then use view options zoom. Okay, so as I say, this is, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is a, a basic VGA text driver. You know, it's got some constants, some data, um, an object, it, it loads another object, and then there's some methods. And if I run that through spin to CPP, I get something like this. Um, I actually did this a while ago, but it adds a comment saying it was automatically generated and the, the code, the command line that was used to build it. And you can see it takes the comments and converts those uh, into C comments. It adds includes that we need like propeller2.h. The VGA text.h is because there's the uh, VGA. Oh, no, actually, this is, yeah, the, the constants that it defined in the con. So things like columns and rows got translated into and put in the header file. Um, and there's a bunch of declarations. Then there's this dat array. That's everything from the dat section, including compiled PASM code. This particular example doesn't have any PASM code. It's just got the font data. So we'll skip over that. And then we get down to the methods like start. Um, so it, it creates a C function called VGA text underscore start that corresponds to this um, method start here. And you can see it does translate the comments, you know, calculate clock frequency, calculate the scale. And it's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping. Most spin constructs have, you know, C equivalents. Um, it prepends the word VGA text to avoid conflicts. So since this object was a VGA text uh, dot spin two, it gets added to everything, and it takes the f the first parameter. The the original start method just had a pin base parameter. This one has a self parameter, which points to the data, you know, the vars, and then the rest of the parameters are there. So this is the kind of code you get. It's a little bit awkward in places, you know, and there's, there's casts um, where like font pointer equals address of font data gets turned into this kind of ugly cast thing. But most of the time it's not, totally awful, you know, the if statement is just a plain if statement, if font height equals 15, you know, if VGA text font height equals 15. Um, so it's it's usable, you can even hand edit it in some cases. Um, although most of the time you would probably just keep the original spin driver and, and have it generated by your make file or build system, you know, automatically can convert your spin to C using the tool. Uh, whoops. Okay, let me get back. The uh, desktop. Uh, there are some. Whoops. Ah. There are some limitations for spin to CPP. Um, the biggest one is inline assembly. Um, as I mentioned, all the compilers have different 
syntax for inline assembly. So spin to CPP just actually it it could I think it may try to output GCC style inline assembly. It's not very good at it though. So practically speaking, you can't use inline assembly in your spin two driver if you want to convert it automatically to C. Um, if the PASM code refers to absolute addresses, you have to you may have to call a, something called do relocs to relocate it at runtime to the proper addresses. Um, GCC and LLVM can actually do this automatically, so most of the time you won't even notice. But if you're using the other compilers, you'll have to insert a, a call. This is less of an issue nowadays because we know, you know, spin2 doesn't support absolute addresses if you're mixing PASM and spin2, so just don't do that. <laughs> and, and both spin2 and spin2CPP will be happier. And um, I've mostly been focused in, in the fast spin and spin to CPP on the fast spin side of things. So it's very possible that some spin to built-ins won't be converted to properly to their C equivalents. Um, if you find some, just report them and we'll fix them. You know, it, usually it's a, it's a trivial thing. It's just adding something to a table that I've forgotten to add. So that's pretty much it. Um, I can uh, take some questions if anyone has good questions. Yeah, questions, comments, just unmute yourself or you can type it. Eric, I'm curious what your opinion is um, about uh, writing C or using C in general on the P2 as opposed to the P1, since you have so much experience with both. Oh, it's uh, it's night and day. I mean, the P2 has got so much more memory um, and the instruction set is is definitely much better for um, C. You know, on, on the P1, we had to use something called LL, LMM, which is kind of like a little interpreter <laughs> for the P2 in, or P1 instructions. On P2, it's built into the chip. You know, you can execute directly from hub. So it's a much better chip for C. Eric, um, just a question comment. Um, we'll talk more about this uh, with the other C developers, but how Parallax can get behind it in the future. I was thinking it might be beneficial to the users to standardize on one compiler or not because of differences between them. So for hosting code, it can easily run. Because yeah. C is, and the issue is C is not totally familiar to us internally as everybody knows. <laughs> and we we want this to be accessible by our customers and we're just, we just need to think and talk together how we could do that. But what's your thought on that? Well, it's it's difficult right now, as I sort of mentioned. There's no one P2 compiler that's to rule them all. <laughs> you know, they they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, it'll certainly be interesting to see. I think it's Nikolai that's developing the new LLVM-based compiler. That's what Jeff pointed it'll, out too. Yeah, it'll certainly be interesting to see how that comes along. Um, I think. In the short term, the most important thing is to try to standardize on libraries so that we can make code portable between the different compilers. And the new compiler is going to need a library anyway. So the more we can do to, you know, write a standard set of C libraries and the standard, like we have defined the propeller 2.h, which I think everyone is, uh, has bought into. And maybe we can go a bit further and develop, you know, some standards for how some of the other library functions are um, handled and maybe even convert some of the spin to um, existing spin to objects to, um, to C, or at least to make it easy to convert them automatically with spin to CPP. Um, I see David's uh, commented that the P1 and P2 are not C friendly. Um, 
that's true in a sense. I mean, they certainly, um, the performance of, of C or any compiled language on the P2 is, is nothing to write home about. But they're fine. You know, the instruction set for the P2 is certainly adequate for writing a C compiler. There's nothing, nothing to hold you back. Um, and Chip, Chip did a nice job. Uh, he added a lot of things to make, make it uh, more compiler friendly. I really like how Fastbin makes it super easy to communicate with other languages, especially Spin. So you can just like reference a Spin object and call the functions in it directly from your C code. It's really nice. Yeah, um, that's what I was aiming for. Um, the, the drawback of Fastbin, of course, is that it is a custom compiler, so it's buggy and you know it doesn't have the thousands of hours of of development that something like GCC or LLVM has. It'll it'll get better though. You're fixing things. People are using it now and giving you a lot more feedback and iterations are getting better and better each time. I, yeah, I, I think so. Um, definitely. But yeah, that's that feature of just being able to include any spin or basic uh, and call it from C is really, really nice. Use, it allows people to share code better and more easily. That's certainly the goal, yeah. And I think we're seeing a similar approach emerge with the MicroPython effort. Um, I don't think it's not going to be quite as easy in MicroPython because it's but, not a, we'll have to see what, what they come up with. Um, the version of MicroPython I compiled using the RISC-V uh, compiler did have the ability to, to launch code in other COGS. Um, so it would certainly be feasible to do a spin to Python converter similar to spin to CPP. Well, we certainly have customers who um, won't look deeper at the P2 and, until they see C. As, as you know, from reading the forums, um, we get that request from larger companies that already have engineers trained a certain way and want to get the job done at any cost with what they already know. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there who use C every day in their, in their jobs. And uh, I think it's pretty important to have it on the P2. There's some really good comments about um, streaming in about uh, the naming convention of fast spin. I don't know if you've read that, Eric. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm no good with names. I've stumbled uh, on that before myself. Yeah, um, at some point, actually, it turns out there is another program called Flex GUI, so I need to rename the whole thing, and I've just been, <laughs> I don't know what to name at all. So one of these days we'll come up with a, a good name for it. It's pretty simple. It's Eric's compiler collection, isn't it? <laughs> ECC, I don't know. Um, I'm sure people will, maybe on the forums we can have a discussion about <laughs> names. Let's, Let's have a naming contest. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Can I have a question? Speak up. Uh, I, w I was wondering since uh, uh, there are plans to do some, uh, uh, let's say, universal compiler, uh, are there any plans to, do, to release it under Windows? To release the, the new compiler? Uh, Yes, uh, under Linux, uh, besides Windows, because uh, Linux doesn't have uh, that many solutions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am a Linux user, but I have to, each time uh, I want to compile some code efficiently, I have to do it uh, under a virtual box uh, machine. He's uh, asking about... Uh, 
the ability to compile it on Linux. Yes, yes. Oh. Uh, but I, I, I know that uh, that uh, that are there are compilers that uh, can compile under Linux. Uh, what I was asking is uh, if if there is a plan uh, for Parallax to re release an official uh, compiler that uh, will work under Linux. Well, is that a question for Parallax or for Eric? <laughs> and therein lies the, the challenges, but I think the first challenge is just try to standardize on a compiler and, and then try to be able to compile for Linux as well. I would see that being part of the path. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, I, I had some experience with the P2 PCP. Uh, it worked okay, but uh, for, I, I'm, I, if I'm recalling correctly, it, I think it was P2 PCP. Uh, it uh, worked some, uh, fine, but the project was abandoned. Hmm. Does anybody else remember P2 GCC? Um, Jeff, you might. Well, the P2 GCC, well, all, all four of these compilers do have Linux versions. Um, and, um, and I think certainly Fastspin and RISC-V have Mac versions as well. And I think someone's compiling Catalina for the Mac. Don't know about P2GCC. Um, now P2GCC is is Dave Hines' project. Uh, Roger Lowe's helped him out. I'm not sure what his plans are for for cross-platform um, support, but I'm, definitely I'm, the. I'm not sure if I'm sorry, but I I I here. Maybe because of audio, Samuel, you could also type the question, which might be easier for us. In the meantime, Eric, uh, what about debugging? Is Catalina on, the only compiler that supports source level debugging? Uh, as far as I know at the moment, that's the case. Um, I've certainly thought about ways to do that in fast spin um, and risk five it probably would not be hard to get gdb the, the gnu debugger to work with the risk five compiler since it um you know there is a risk five port of it already um probably not as nice though because it wouldn't understand the code in the cogs um, I'd like to, I mean, Chip's got some really cool debugging features in the in the hardware. I'd like to try to get an interactive debugger of some kind that could just debug PASM code um, and let you interactively look at registers and things like that. That'd be really cool to see. Um, maybe if we could come up with some kind of standard for that, um, that would go a long way because if, if we could debug kind of arbitrary PASM code, then all of these compilers would be able to use it since they all generate PASM. It might not be ideal in the sense of, you know, there might be some work to hook it up to source code, um, but at the very least being able to look at registers and memory would, would be very handy. I think the main problem is that chip is not really in cross platform development currently. I mean, it might work with free Pascal, I'm not sure, but Parallax stuff is all Windows only, um, which is kind of depressing, even if I am a Windows guy, but. Hmm. Well, our silence marks our agreement somewhat, yeah. <laughs> We'd love to be able to support all these platforms, but it definitely involves uh, going back and undoing some things we've already done and redoing a lot of work, which we just, as we've explained on the forums, don't have the time or resources to do. But in time, this might become easier for us.
Yeah, Dan, I can speak to that a little bit. Thanks, Chip. So I just use Windows because it's what I know and it's just a vehicle to get something working. I don't particularly like it. It's just what I it's just what I'm capable of dealing with at the moment. So I grow things in Windows because that's where you know my inertia and know how are. I don't like it that it's that way only, but that's just why it is that way though. If you took a look at that free Pascal thing to translate your Delphi stuff over to kind of Pascal. I, I think that the whole debugging question is a little bit orthogonal to the question of, you know, getting prop tool and, and peanut working cross platform. Um, it would be As long as there's some sort of clear standard of how to communicate with the debugger and if you wrote actually i guess if you wrote a really simple tool that could just there's two parts there's something needs to run on the p2 in the reserve debug area which i think chip already has more or less um, and and ray contributed some stuff as well and then we need a simple tool on the pc side that can talk to that Right now, it's kind of built into the peanut, I guess. But if if we had just a, even a simple command line thing, where you could just type commands like you know dump memory from cog one <laughs> or show cog you know show hub ram at this address, then we could probably leverage that um, for any of the languages and maybe put a shell of some sort up on top of it that it could interface with. Um, source code yeah that could be done uh, the thing is there's interactivity required to make it play um, it all it, you know a debug interrupt always occurs when a cog starts and so at that time you have to be able to when you before you leave that debug interrupt you have to set up what the next interrupt condition is so what I have now is this kind of one-way debugging thing, right? That just spits out data. And that's nice because there's no interactivity required. But as soon as you go interactive, it kind of necessitates, you know, almost some kind of GUI level interaction. I suppose we could do it with less than that. But there's a lot of stuff there that you could possibly do. And it's, it's a big bite to take. I think what you could do is is stay in the debug mode. Um, like once you once you get a debug interrupt, you talk to the PC inter and and just exchange messages. You know, the PC will say, "Show me this memory." You send back the memory. The PC will say, "Okay, set this memory." You set the memory, and then eventually the PC will say, "Okay, resume," <laughs> and then you. Go back yeah. and just you know start running again, and eventually you'll hit another breakpoint. Or you know. well, and remember also there are eight eight processors, right? So that, you yeah. have to actually maintain eight discrete stateful conversations, and have the the uh, protocol support that, so that in some case a cog's going to say, "Okay, well I'm stopped. What do you want me to do?" And the PC or the host may not have an answer at that time, so he'll. Uh, He'll go off and he'll uh, wait for, you know, 100 milliseconds or something and then ask again. And then all eight cogs might be doing that. Um, I, I think for first pass, though, it would be okay to just stop everything if, if any one of them stop. Um, can we do that? Can we? Uh, yeah, what you would do is you would stall the other guy's debug interrupts. That's what would happen in effect. Um, but I mean, right now, actually, they could all go into their debug interrupt, but they couldn't get. I'm using a, a, a lock now to share um, a serial port, right? P62 for the output. So right now, it, it's all set up so that someone gets that resource, they spit something out really quick, and they release it so that somebody else could take it. So in the case of inputting also um, 
that would be, you know, whose responsibility of eight would that be? I guess we could set up anytime anybody is talking on the serial, anytime anybody has a serial port, they have to maybe pull that receive smart pin and see if uh, anything came in and then put it into a circular buffer and then have some means of divining who's, who the message was actually for, cogwise. Because we have eight so, things going on and we've got you, you know, one or two communication pins. Yeah, there's certainly a bottleneck there. But you know, even being able to debug just one cog at a time <laughs> would, would be a, a big win. Well, yeah, that could be done. I mean, you can select which cog is, is uh, going to have debug interrupts. So yeah, you, that, that would be one way to do it. Then that could, that, if, you, if you could get it down to one cog, it would lend itself to some kind of command line interaction. Or, you know, a, a simple exchange through a terminal program or something. In fact, um, I think Osprop Dev has a couple of debuggers, maybe he can speak up, that can work that way. Brian, you want to say anything? I don't think he's here. Maybe not. He, he, he seems to be here, but he's not unmuting. So maybe he wandered off for a minute. I mean, his name's on the uh, list here. Brian Dennis. That's Osprop Deb, right? I don't think so. Or is it? Yeah. And then Rogers Roblo. Oh, well, maybe he's wandered off for a coffee. One question for you, Chip. Uh, as right. far as your debugger, you basically attach it in front of your spin or whatever program, start the debugger first, and then jump into the first cog, right? Right. Okay, so when you have a delay there, then some terminal program can come up. But basically, wouldn't it be possible that, um, that is now a question for Eric, that he basically attached the same loading stop thing in front of fast spin and also install the debugging stop in the upper hub and then start the fast, I mean, couldn't Eric basically do the same thing with oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just did it one way that seemed um, useful, you know, viable, but there, there are many ways the whole thing could be realized. Um, the, way, the way it works in my case, I, my compiler uh, goes through those debug statements when debug is enabled, and it parses things apart, puts some stuff up in that image that's going to go into the top of memory, and then pushes a little bit of data down where the actual breakpoint is. Um, so it's not, there's like, I don't know how we could make a one size fits all thing. I'm sure it's possible, but I don't, it's not on the top of my head now how to do that. Because, you know, if these things are, they're complex for me anyway, to kind of figure out and then implement. And I, that's why I need to like, you know, maintain my own tool so that I can do these kinds of experiments and these developments in. I, I mean, it's, I couldn't just realize all this stuff by saying, hey, Eric, you know, can we, it would just take, it would be really cumbersome and it would, it would slow down. So I have to have means to, you know, work closely to, to, uh, on the goal. And so any implementation that, you know, Eric does is going to require some similar level of engagement on his part. Um. Chip, there, there is a protocol, there's a, um, the GNU people have a protocol for GDB. Um, it's pretty low level, you know, it, it doesn't do everything you, you might necessarily well, that, want to in do. In the end, this thing is simple. It, it really only does like three or four things on a breakpoint. It can set yep. the next breakpoint, it can query memory, 
It can write to some state information, and then it can say continue. Yep, and that's pretty much all the GDB protocol needs. And they do have support for multiple threads, uh, you know, for debugging multi-core processors. So that might be a place to look, you know, if, if we were to implement that protocol. It's just a simple ASCII. It's been a yeah. while since I've looked at it, but but in a in an earlier life, I did implement that on a on another micro, and it, there wasn't much to it. It's just an ASCII protocol. Yeah, that would. I thought a lot about this. You know, we need efficient data communication, but we also need to know like when does it when does a message start. So I was thinking if we use like base sixty four for data conveyance, and then use characters outside of base sixty four, which is just the upper lowercase digits and plus and divide. I think that we can we can trigger like message starts on those other characters, so that no matter what some where someone is in the line, they can always perceive properly where the registrations are. Yeah, well, like I say, it's definitely worth looking at, at the GDB protocol and because they've they've solved this on a bunch of processors, ARM and x86. And Just using this GDB. Uh, Chip, this is Steve Morocco. Um, I have, you're talking about a variable length protocol. Are you, is it fixed in your mind that you want to go variable length for messages or would you, can you go fixed? Wait, say that again about you said fixed length and then something about variable I didn't understand. Okay, I'll try and speak more clearly. Um, one of the things we do with uh, hobby rocketry telemetry is we do fixed length protocols over RF links so that we can always know where the packetizing is and we can recognize in fronts. In this kind of scheme, is that an opportunity for you or do you have, do you want to be variable length? Um, I could see that that would bring, bring some simplification to things and uh, you know, it, if we were fixed length, I'd have to kind of like packetize, make everything so that it could be packetized, right? Right. And, and that could be done. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to it. Whatever, whatever works out and makes for an efficient solution is all I really think about. So I, th I think all we're talking about for the, I was beginning to look at the GDB. I think you're talking about the uh, GDB remote serial protocol. Am I correct, Eric? Yes. Yes, okay. that's what I was thinking of. Okay, um, so there's probably stream identifiers and then packet identifiers and then the payloads. And so it could be pretty simple to make it multiprocessor and make it fixed length. And that may give you some real freedoms in there and getting something done quickly and easily. Just thinking out loud. Yeah, if we can come up with a, a, a simple low level protocol, then we can build on that and realize anything else with GUIs or you know, command line interfaces or whatnot. I'd be certainly willing to uh, kick into the discussion anytime. All right, I'll, I'll research this. Is it GDP or GDB? Golf Delta Bravo, GDB. Okay, okay. Remote serial protocol, I can, uh, let's see what I've got here. Chip, I put a link in the chat. I was just gonna do this again. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. Thanks. All right. There's Brian. Yeah. So I've had a bit of uh, Zoom problems, but I think I'm back now. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. On the debug um, stuff, I've got a um, debugger I've nearly finished at the moment that's um, it's spin two, but it launches all your other cogs in debug mode. So there's one cog that pretty much is just monitoring all the others. So you can break in to any cog, stop, examine, change registers, look at flags um, and jump out again. Um, or you can stop them all and then individually jump in, dump memory, you can do all that sort of stuff. But it, it's all written in spin two. So um, I hope to finish that off in the next few weeks, but I've been busy with a lot of other stuff at the moment. It's so it'd be easy to glean the concepts out of there. And I, you showed me this sure. once, and yeah. I just, yeah, and you were going to maybe make a list of the commands. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, it's grown a bit since then. Um, I think when I showed it to you last, it only supported one cog. Now they're all in debug mode. So, um, yeah, and it's a bit more expanded from when you saw it last. Um, 
but yeah, I'm, I've nearly finished that, but it's mayhem here at the moment, so um, I, I'll get to it. It's on my list for sure. Okay. Okay, that's good to know. So yeah, yeah so it's all in Spanish too, so it should be easy to for people to pull it apart and see how it all works. But you can actually yeah. see, you can single step. You can actually see um, the code running, and it all disassembles into PASM. Um, so you can you can see exactly what's going on, and you can trigger interrupts if you want, or you can see interrupts pending. Um, so yeah, it's all in there, and it's all command line. It's all done from serial terminal. So um, it's I've just got to make up some better documentation on it because at the moment I'm the only one who knows how to use it. So yeah, it's yeah. all there. Okay, good. So that's kind of what you'd be interested in, right, Eric? Yeah, that's that sounds like what I need. Uh, just something that I can debug PASM. Yeah, yeah, and then and then if we if we go with the GDB, I mean the GDB is like a, a low level exchange protocol, right? But does it does it enable one to use debuggers that can then be configured within some GDB context so that they can do work? Well, yeah, um, there are debuggers that talk that protocol. Obviously, GDB itself is a debugger, um, and it's a source level debugger. But I mean, to, to use it, we would need a way to communicate symbols and source code information to it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but, I know. You know, it's doable. OK. I know Brian's is very kind of low level. It's pretty much like a machine language debugger, right, Brian? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was well, really use, useful when we were working on the chip and all of the, um, oh, like the repeat modes and other things. It took a long time to shake out. Brian found all kinds of problems that I was able to fix in the in the Verilog that I wasn't, you know, really aware of. There are all kinds of little sleeper issues in there. But so now the, the debug thing seems to work you know, when you code it up and you run it, then it works just like you would expect it to. Yeah, I, I know just from my own experience, finding my own bugs even with it, it's been brilliant for that. Um, things that you just couldn't work out in your head. And as soon as you, you could get into the debugger and see it step by step, it, <laughs> the, the answer just jumps straight out at you. It's, it, it's quite handy. It's, it's quite a neat feature. Yeah. Yeah, being able to step debug is really vital for some types of algorithm figuring out and and uh, especially when you have multiple processes running simultaneously communicating with each other, you know, you get a lot of race conditions and deadlocks and whatnot. Yeah. Man, I think that would be about impossible to debug on a P2 because everything's running independently, right? Well, you're talking I, about. I, I do that on the PC all the time. We're running multi core and running, you know, dozens of threads, and the debugger shows you the stacks for every thread, and you step through. You can focus right. on one thread, and the other threads will step as your thread steps, and you can let them free run or, or block with each break and stuff like that. Okay, so the granularity is thread activity, it's not clock by clock state, you know, changes in every in every core or anything like that. Oh, no, I, I mean, I can step single machine instructions in a given thread. Okay, but not not in parallel cores at once, though, right? Oh, when I when I'm foc you, when you're debugging, you're you, you're uh, focused on one thread, but the other threads are also lock stepping. When you're in the broken state, they're all stopped also, and then they continue. Okay. When you step, they do a step. I see. Of course, you still have like the OS running and all kinds of stuff is going on in the background, mm -hmm. so it's not quite the same. But yeah. But you can definitely you can definitely see like if you have two threads running, and one of them is uh, 
doing a loop over some data and the other one is trying to read that data and you have mutex as you can see all that going on. Yeah, so that would that that would all apply to the P2 also then. Yeah. I think the most difficult thing would be debugging something where at least one of your cogs is you know actively accessing data that's coming in via IO pins of some sort of an analog nature or whatever when you've got another cog stop that's relying on that. For I sure. And, and then the other wrinkle is smart pins, right? Because you have smart pins doing their thing and you're not going to stop them from like finishing a cycle and raising the in and then your cog is, hasn't gotten to the point where it's going to read that yet, right? Right. Yeah, on this graphical debugging stuff, I found that you just don't have any time to interrupt some processes that are in assembly language that are using hardware. So I just have it, you know, dump it to some uh, couple variables in hub and then have another processor do the debug on the data itself. And that works great. Okay, well, we're coming up on just across an hour and a half. So it seems to me that maybe the next step is we have a sub live, but still a live forum on C to talk about how we, how we could actually make this more visible at Parallax and what kinds of steps we'd have to take to do that. Keeping in mind, we don't really have much in the way of uh, human resources coders to, to do much of anything, but we do have, um, like several of you pointed out, the place where people go looking for the languages when they discover the P2 before they wind up at the forums. So we just need to figure out where we fit and how we can support Eric the best way and the community that wants to see. So I'll be looking for anyone that wants to join us in that in the next, probably the next couple weeks. Does that seem like an appropriate step? Because what I see is, uh, viable C programming, but um, several different efforts, which seem to be okay with some, but maybe we need to bring what we can together and have some standards for at least libraries so code can work using different compilers, that kind of thing. Any yes, input on exactly. that? Okay, so getting Yeah, the, if, we, if, if we get a subset at least of like the basic libraries and the interfacing to the P2, because like uh, C doesn't know anything about P2 as far as the special features, right? So we all, we do that with what looks like library or built-in extensions. Um, so as long as we sort of try to standardize what those are so that, you know, your source code is the same between them, even if the backend compiles it differently, that doesn't matter. But as long as like when you want to do a cog, start a cog, you do cog start with the parameters in a certain order, right? If that's mm -hmm. the same across all of them, then it works. And, and similarly for other stuff, not just uh, specific to P2, but like the standard library, which all of the compilers use the C standard library and just have different amounts of it implemented. Eventually they'll all have a pretty robust standard library support and that covers a lot of what we need you don't really have to enforce that because that's already defined it's part of the standard yeah good so maybe in uh, two weeks we can discuss this then openly with whoever wants to participate that includes you roy yeah yeah and like after after the next two like maybe the uh, presentation that's not a presentation, but more just a discussion. One of these Zoom meetings yeah. where we just talk about the C standard and what kind of standard interfaces to the P2 we'd like to, you know, and highlight some that already exist. Like Eric and Ross already agreed upon Propeller 2.h and what should be in there and some of what should be in there and made it so that some parts of the things are compatible between Catalina and FAST. And then, yeah, quite honestly, we'll need some some uh, input on 
the communication part of this, like uh, the marketing or non-marketing of it. Yeah, there are a lot of questions rolling around in my head what it, what it really means, you know, to have C and what, it, what becomes expected of Parallax and, you know, how to uh, ensure that it's viable for Eric. Um, so that because customers are wandering and expect things and we may not be able to please them and that might hurt us a little bit. So th those kinds of things I, I really would like to discuss openly and understand. I, th I think it's important. It's going to be hard to please all the C, all the customers that want C, because they're all going to have their preference of, oh, I want LLVM or I want GCC or I want X, right? Because that's what they're used to using. <laughs> um, right. But uh, you can you can definitely cover a. a more of a majority of them by having a reasonable standard library support and fairly simple ways to talk to the p2 special hardware right and drive it to do its special stuff yeah excellent i mean it should be pointed out too that c is the backbone of our blockly prop efforts which have been very successful the simple libraries which all of you contributed in so thank you for that, especially Eric. Well, Roy's been doing a great job of porting the simple libraries to P2, so. Uh, yeah, I saw Jeff was chatting with him about that a while ago. Yeah, me and Jeff went back and forth privately. The, the area I'm working on now is getting all this stuff. So simple libraries is a whole bunch of stuff, but they're all built on simple tools.h and the stuff that that header provides and there's a bunch of features in there that all use the propeller one counter logic uh, which doesn't exist on the p2 in the same form instead you have the functions inside the smart smart pins that do most of the same things and so i'm having to figure out the smart pins to try to implement those features and i've got like two or three of them working but there's two or three more that are being troublesome because I'm still figuring out the docs and also just having issues where like, I think I've got it working right and it works sometimes, but not other times. Like hmm. I'm continuously reading, uh, doing an RC time calculation and it's spitting out the numbers and, you know, three of them will be the correct number and then I'll get a bunch of zeros and then I'll get the correct number a few times and then I'll get a bunch of zeros. And, but on the P1, it's the correct number all the time. So hmm. it's just some kind of timing or, configuration of the smart pin not being quite right well yeah you know sure. something that's that trips me up on the smart pins a lot is they signal with na and you can use that to trigger an interrupt or you can sense you, you can make an event that you can wait for or, or pull for and uh if you miss those then the whole thing kind of loses synchronicity and uh you're out in the weeds real fast and so it's it it's kind of tricky and it, every time I got to use smart pins, I have to like, you know, read the docs again that I wrote and then even like, you know, maybe in some cases go back to the barrel log to be sure of what I'm reading because I, we just need to make examples and uh, use cases, use case examples that show, uh, you know, how they have to work and what the pitfalls are. And then it could be pretty fail safe, but, I always yeah. stumble. I stumble all the time with the smart pins. Yeah, one of the things I haven't really done much of is having them using the whole event thing. I'm mostly doing uh, one shot things like fire and forget and then just going back and updating by calling the function again. Uh, yeah, you got two different times there, right? You tell the pin to start something, it starts doing it. And then you might be back in a flash and it's like we're a third of the way done with the job or something. Well, no, I, I do wait for the in signal, right, oh. to, go, to go up. But uh, it's just uh, I'm not like using the interrupt event or any of that kind of stuff. I just configure the smart pin and then wait for in to be high and then read the result. Yeah. I, I found that like putting the debug statements into things that are, you know, the same processor that's running interrupts can be dangerous because it can cause the interrupt to go so long that it doesn't get seen and, and then it loses the chain. 
know, and the, the uh, interrupt cycling is broken after that. Well, we have standing requests um, to get Chip on John Titus's draft documentation to make simple examples, which should help all of us. Yeah. Most common simple examples. Maybe I'll understand them too. Okay, we'll wrap this up with a tremendous thank you for Eric. Everybody, thumbs up to Eric. Oh, we have one last suggestion from Samuel. He's going to type it or say it. We'll see. And we know that he's on the forums anyway, in case he doesn't. Uh, Jeff, Jeff suggested we should have a, like a kind of a free for all forum where people can talk about whatever's on their mind. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a good <laughs> idea, actually. Yeah, that could be one of the fill the three week gap ones. That's okay. exactly what I was thinking because the end of this meeting kind of turned into that with some collaboration and idea sharing that I think is very fruitful. Okay, we'll book yeah. it now. I think I think that is a good idea, and also the what, like we discussed earlier, having one of those be just a discussion of the C standardization of libraries slash interfacing to the P two. And Eric, did you see Samuel's suggestion? Yes, and, and okay. Samuel, if, I presume you're talking about Flex GUI, and uh, there is a menu item for it. <laughs> um, under the special menu, there's a terminal only um, item. So it's not a button, but it is a menu item. Ken, if there is another blank spot, maybe based on what Chip was just saying, you have an hour talking about the smart pens and solutions we've come up with because I'm only writing in spin, but others are writing in C. So yeah, I think John Titus, He's doing all of his work in assembly. Uh, it would be nice to talk so that everybody is, regardless of language, is implementing the smart pens the way Chip cool. intended them to be implemented. So that regardless of language, a given task gets the same response. Okay, we'll book yeah. that then. Um, after, before Jeff, after Chip, we have a couple in there. I'll, we'll put that together. And we would just love to have Johnny Mac share some of his objects as well on the mm -hmm. P2 Live Forum. Well, I'm happy to talk about that stuff all day long. I, I'm a storyteller. I live in Hollywood. So, <laughs> you know, it would be a very long day. But, you know, most of the stuff that I'm doing is really straightforward. What I'm trying to do, and this is my personal goal, is just to implement things that I've done and others have done really cleanly in P2 in that style. I mean, there, there is, I, I was talking to a friend of ours, uh, Ryan Clark, the other day. He was asking me about the P2. And as something I pointed out earlier, it is, in my opinion, phenomenally more efficient than the P1. And I have found, like I said, I was surprised when I finished my, my pixel code, how much smaller the assembly section was P2 versus P1. It was dramatically, the same thing happened with my UART code for the, uh, what, the DMX stuff. Um, you know, that's a case where I'd, I'd wanna have a discussion on the smart pins because in DMX, you know, you have to do this break condition before you send the stream. So that, that would seem like you have to reconfigure the smart pin for the break and then reconfigure it for the bytes in the stream and, I didn't do that. I, I just bit bang the UART and it was six lines of code to send a byte. Uh, you know, it was, it was stupid easy. And uh, so I kept it that way, but maybe there's a better way that I'm not seeing because I still, I've, I've made some aspects of the smart pin work, but some not so much. I really struggled okay. with this I stuff. So I think we'll do smart pins on the, 20th and then we'll do um johnny mack king of propellers from hollywood shares entertainment applications on the 27th i guess you're okay with that john you still there yeah sorry i was doing the visual thing yes yeah, so i i now i i'm look i got my notebook out so that i can write this down and prepare i'll remind something. you <laughs>
Great. <laughs> so, okay. okay. And like I said in chat, uh, we all have to have a discussion about how to get Phil Pilgrim to join us in PT land. <laughs> <laughs> we would all benefit from his wisdom on code and uh, projects. He and Tracy Allen. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. And so we'll conclude, let the Aussies start their day, the Euros owners go to bed, and the rest of us do whatever. Go back to work. Go back to work or start the work day. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Bye Thanks, now. everyone.